Well, hello. I wanted to take time to show you another photo restoration. Uh, the last one I did was pretty popular, and so I wanted to uh, take some time to do another kind of historic photo restoration, this time using both Bridge and Camera Raw. These are both Adobe products. So in order to get to Camera Raw, which is where I do a lot of photo manipulation, we start in Bridge. And it is Bridge that you're looking at right now. And Bridge was originally intended to be a program that literally bridges between one Adobe product to the other. And so here we are in Bridge. And today's subject is going to be the Back Creek Quaker, really the Back Creek Friends Meeting House, the Quaker Church in Randolph County, North Carolina. And what I want to do is I want to restore this image. And I was at this church uh, on Memorial Day weekend in 2008. And one of the th cool things about Bridge is it's a great way for you to use Bridge as a gallery for all of your images. And while I was at Back Creek, I went and photographed a bunch of my ancestors tombstones and this was back when I guess find a grave was probably just getting started um, but I went and photographed a bunch of the ancestors everybody with the Henley uh, name because I didn't know exactly where they fit in the family at the time but I knew I had some of the founding fathers of this Quaker church and I wanted to photograph everyone I could find. I was particularly looking for some of the early Henleys, but I did find out later that um, a good portion of the, in fact, you can see this big open field, there I am, <laughs> smiling face, that a good portion of the cemetery, uh, they had removed the tombstones because the Quakers believed in uh, not uh, making a big deal about themselves and so anybody who had too much information on their tombstones it was removed so there's big open field there where there actually are people buried but there are no tombstones since that time I guess the church has changed their opinion a little bit and so um, full names and dates are on some of the tombstones starting around I think around the mid 1800s um, but this church dates back all the way back to the late 1700s and so some of these tombstones are really old and so one of the things that I did while I was there let me see if I can find this image I went and I visited uh, the inside of this uh, this church, uh, the meeting house, and you can see here it was established in 1792, although this says established in 1785. And some of the history that I was reading, it you know it was I guess it was a process for which uh, it took to get uh, the church going. It uh, was founded from another uh, Quaker meeting. I think it was the center monthly meeting in North Carolina. Anyway, this isn't really meant to be a history about the uh, Friends Church here in Randolph County, but really more of a discussion about how to go about using both Bridge and Camera Raw, which Camera Raw is kind of a, it's an in-between program. You would go to Camera Raw, manipulate an image, and then go into Photoshop if you needed to. But a good portion, boy, 80% of what I do these days is in Camera Raw, and I never open Photoshop if if it's not needed. So the cool part about Bridge is you can, first of all, you can look at really big thumbnails uh, and there are various different ways of, of viewing things. You can look at things as a film strip here. But the other cool part about it is that it keeps your XDIF data very handy. So in this case, I as I was going, okay, I'm gonna do this episode about this church and this is the image that I'm going to restore here in a moment. And that's kind of the after. I'm gonna show you what it started as. But it's it's got a lot of this information in here uh, that tells me that, oh yeah, it was back in 2008, that was a good long time ago, that I took these images, and I'm going to dial this back down so we can see several images all at one time. But, so there's a lot of information in here. You can also set uh, keywords. I mean, there's just there's just a lot you can do. This is really not intended to be a tutorial about Bridge, but I did want to point it out because this is where we kind of start from. And so as we start our discussion about Camera Raw and how to do photo 
restoration and camera raw. A couple things that I want to point out is nowadays I shoot all my photographs in the raw format, which is not to be confused with the software camera raw. Okay. But a lot of our older images, and these are from 2008, like I mentioned, were shot in JPEGs. RAW can handle a lot of different formats, but when you're dealing with JPEGs as opposed to a RAW format, JPEGs have a little bit more limited ability to manipulate those, and I'll show you those in a minute. That if you have a RAW file, which if you have a modern day camera, it most likely has a RAW function. You can, you can photograph your images in RAW, and I highly recommend it because you can do a lot more manipulation with it after the fact. For example, if you look at this image here, it's dark, right? This is this is the image that I photographed in the front of that church that day. So we're going to try and recover this image, right? And this is how it looked the day I was there in this frame. Now, normally you would scan this at a really high resolution. You would take it out of the frame and you would scan it at at least 600 dpi, okay? So going back to the conversation about RAW versus JPEG, when you scan an image as a digital image or you photograph an image as a RAW image, you have a lot more manipulation ability in Camera Raw, the software. Okay, so if you have a JPEG, it's going to have this JPG ex extension is a JPEG. If you shot it on a Nikon and it was a raw image, it would have an NEF extension. And if you shot it with a Canon, it's going to have a CRW or a CR2 extension for camera raw. Okay. Now there is also another extension called a DNG, which basically stands for digital negative. And that is kind of a generic, that's Adobe's open format extension. And so a lot of people will convert their raw files to a DNG format, thinking that the longevity will last longer. So I have mixed emotions about that. I think both Nikon and Canon raw files will be around for a long time and will continue to have the ability to archive that information. Uh, when we're talking about family history and try, trying to talk about preservation. The DNG format is, is really kind of a generic raw format. So any of those extensions will work. Now, in this case, these two images were shot as JPEGs. They were not shot as raw. Now, if I hold the shift key down and select both images, I can open both of these in camera raw at the same time. And you can do that in one of two ways. You can come up here and click on this open in camera raw icon. It looks like a, the iris of a lens, really. I am a right click kind of girl. I right click everything. So if you right click and open in camera raw, then that launches not only the program, but it also launches both of these images. So now we can look at both of these images. Now the cool part about camera raw is you can manipulate one image and sync it to a whole list of other images, or you can adjust both of these by holding the shift key down or the control key down and and click on both of these images simultaneously. And then every adjustment that we make would happen to both images simultaneously. Okay. But I'm really only going to do a major portion of the work on this image right here. But for grins and giggles, I'm going to just show you a couple little things here. So if we take a tour around the page here, we have a list of tools across the top. And as we hover over them, we get this pop-up that tells us what they are. And we're going to go through some of these, but not all of them. But for now, we're going to stick on the zoom tool, which gives us the ability to really zoom in and take a look at this image. And we can see some faces long ago. If I hold the alt key down, I don't know if you can see the little um, magnifying glass there, but without the alt key, just normally, like hands off the keyboard, it is in the plus mode. If I hold the alt key down, it does the opposite. So it, it gives me the minus key, which in this case is going to let me zoom out, right? Holding the space bar down out gives me the hand, which gives me the ability to move the image around. So those are the two keys that you really want to know is the alt key as the opposite of whatever is selected. And the hand key is going to allow me to move things around. So coming on over here to this portion of the screen, this is the histogram. And the histogram is giving us the, in this case, color information, but also the, the value from black to white, 
the value of what uh, the image is showing us. In this case, it's a very flat image and it's a very dark image. So you're seeing a lot of the histogram is over here on the left hand side. Coming down, we have a lot of different menus to play with and we'll get into some of these here shortly, but some of them will not apply necessarily, especially some of the color information. We'll get into that a little bit, but most of the color information is not going to apply for family or uh, historic photo restoration because a lot of the images are black and white to begin with. Now it might be that we want to enhance some of the color frame and that kind of stuff so we could talk about that a little bit or remove it and make it a black and white completely. So coming on down the list here we've got the color profile. Now this is a JPEG file. Because this is a JPEG file we're only going to have two options color or monochrome. We could flip it to monochrome immediately and make it a black and white. That's an easy fix. I'm going to leave it in color mode. This white balance is going to be uh, limited also because of it being a JPEG but Keep in mind, a lot of these drop-down menus have a lot more options when you're dealing in the original RAW files. These were never shot in RAW. These were shot in JPEG, so this is what I'm, I'm dealing with. As we come down, so we could auto white balance that, but in this case, it's not going to do a lot because there's, there's just not a lot there. You can change the color temperature sliders to make them blue, make them warmer. If you uh, have this highlighted, you can a lot of times zero this out and it'll, it'll take you back to where you were. This is a holdover from where I was the last time I was in here. I'm going to hit zero and zero that out. You can hit auto expose here and it will it will adjust all of these to, to the best of its ability to try and fix what you've got here. That is just ugly to me, so I'm not even going to mess with that. You can go back to default and it will change it all back. If you want, you can individually adjust the sliders and you can watch the histogram up above move. And the idea is you really want kind of a hump in the middle. You want some information over here and you want some information as far over here as you can. But that top slider just makes that really ugly, right? And we can play with contrast. Going to the left makes everything washed out. Going to the right makes everything sh sharper, more contrast. This is a really bad image to start with because it's out of focus and everything. If we pull the highlights down, if we were just to do some really fast adjustments, there's not a lot to do with this image because it is so bad. We can crank up the clarity. The idea is to go from top to bottom, right? If we don't like any of that, we can go back to the default. All right, so we're going to stop playing with this image because it really doesn't um, do us any good to work with this image anyway because uh, you want to start with the best image you can. The best image I have here is uh, this image. So we're going to start first. Is First of all, I want to straighten this photograph. You can see that it's skewed sideways. Well, I can take this tool up here, which is the transform tool, or you can hit shift T and you can see the keyboard shortcut is listed there for you if you want to memorize the keyboard shortcuts. So what's going to happen with this tool is I'm going to draw I'm going to draw a line around one side. You're not going to see anything happen on the first line, but when I start to draw the second line, things will start to happen and watch. It's starting to straighten up. We can draw a line across the top. We can draw a line across the bottom. And if we like what we see there, I'm going to inch that in just a little bit. And actually, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit because I want to grab that handle. So if I zoom way back, I can actually grab these handles because I got them off the screen. I'm going to pull these in just a little bit. And because that's so far away, I want to be able to see that closer. And that's pretty close. So then I can apply that by hitting Enter. And now I've got the image a little bit straighter. Now if I want to crop it, I come over here to the crop tool and I drag. I'm going to drag. Now a word of caution about cropping. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and do this. But if you have a cardboard frame around the outside, I do not recommend you crop out the cardboard frame. And the reason for that is because it helps identify the age of the photograph. Any framing that you have on an image helps identify the aging of a photograph. That is why I preserved 
the original photograph in its frame so that we can see its context to help date it. So all I did there to crop that, I had selected it and hit enter. So now let's start working on this image. I usually like to keep the zoom tool selected while I'm working and I'm going to work in the color space. I could turn this to black and white like that too, but I'm going to stick with the color space for now. I'm not going to worry about the tint or the color cast just yet. I really want to get the exposure up. Now I can tell right now just the way this image is without any kind of doctoring. It's first of all noisy. It was shot in a not great environment when I photographed it. Um, I did not have the right equipment with me. Um, I was not able to remove it from the frame. It was a very challenging situation and you can tell just by zooming in that there's not a lot of detail in the faces. So early on, I'm going to tell you that you cannot expect to regain what is not there to begin with. You can kind of tell this guy has a mustache. You can tell he's wearing a hat and there's a shadow over his eyes. Um, this guy's probably the most readable of the bunch. And you can see a lot of color noise. See all that green and purple speckly stuff. We're going to fix that. Um, but I'm just, I'm just saying that some of the photo restoration, whoops, I'm zooming. This is the scrubby zoom. So scrubby zooms down here. When you turn scrubby zoom on, when you go left, it goes out. When you go right, it goes in. That can be very beneficial. And then in combination with using the space bar and the hand tool, you can move things around in and out and it kind of is helpful. I'm hoping I'm not making you sick watching that. But once this image starts to come out, you're going to see some pretty cool things about the building and um, well, you'll see. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say fit in view. Okay. And the way Adobe likes to work is they like to work from top to bottom. So um, we can auto this. I'm not going to do it. It's just to me, I have more ability, I think, to pull this out than what auto will do. But first thing I'm going to do is I am going to pull up the exposure quite a bit. And again, I'm keeping an eye on the histogram the whole time. And the other thing is, and I'll show this more in a minute, but you'll notice the little light gray areas as I hover around in the histogram. This allows us to adjust those areas. These are the darks, the shadows, these are the blacks, these are the shadows, these are the midtones, these are the highlights, and these are the whites. So I can adjust just by hovering in there. I can adjust just that section, for example. I'll show you. I'm clicking and I'm going to try and move. See how the histogram is moving in just the highlight area. And if you'll notice down below, it's just the highlight slider that's moving. So it's just another way I'm going to let go. I could have just done it right here and click and drag this over and move the highlights up and down. And you can see the image change a little bit. This image is so flat. It's really hard to do anything with. I can move the sliders here or I can move them. In that case, this was the shadow. So that's going to be this area. I can make them go left or right. So I'm going to hit default again, just to take this all the way back to the beginning, because I want to show you what you should be doing with the histogram. So in theory, in a perfect image, and this is far from perfect, you should have the histogram should be stretched out to where it's hitting the wall over here or getting close to hitting the wall on the blacks as well as almost hitting the wall on the right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start to stretch that out and I'm going to, I'm going to overdo some of these adjustments for the sake of education here with contrast. So there's a couple ways to do contrast in these old images, but um, a lot of times you can just crank the contrast on these and just watch the image start to come out. And as you can see, that is the case here. Now I am maxed out on the contrast adjustment here, but there's actually more contrast we can add to this, um, but we're not using the contrast adjustment. 
So let's take a look at the highlights. So really I'm ignoring this white frame all the way around, okay? Why? Because it's irrelevant really for the for the historic preservation of this image, this white frame doesn't matter. So I don't care if this white edge here starts to crawl up the wall of this. So I'm going to take the whites. I'm going to jump down to the whites just a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and bring those up and you'll see there's actually more contrast going on here. Okay. Now I'm going to jump back up to the highlights and I can pull up more highlights. And we really haven't washed out any highlights. One of the things you want to be careful with whites and highlights is if you go too far, you see this little blue line starting to crawl up the side. That's really this edge that I didn't crop out. Okay. And if I crop that out, then you wouldn't see that at all. So we really have more room to go with the highlights if we choose. We don't want to get so washed out that we lose the detail in the wood, right? But we're starting to see this really cool looking building back here with the curled, curled wood. This is a really old, old building. I'm going to use, now that was using the scrubby zoom. I'm going to use the space bar to move this back over. I'm going to actually go back and hit fit and view. Okay. So now let's take the shadows. And so now we've got this big dark area that's missing. We're not, we don't have any blacks. We don't have any, hardly any shadows showing. So we're going to continue to stretch out our histogram, which helps add contrast to the image. So as we pull the shadows down, there's not a lot to work with because the image doesn't have a lot to begin with. So the shadow area is already pretty much down as what this is kind of telling me. So I'm going to go and pull the blacks down the best I can and see what else. Look at the contrast start to come out. Now it also helps show all the black spots. But now we're starting to see that there's actually a little boy or somebody down here in the corner. I don't know that I can ever pull that out because that image was so badly damaged in that area. So one of the next things we can do, and I'm going to pull the highlights up even more to see if I can get some of the bright areas of, of the folks. Look at, she's got a shawl on. We're starting to see there's actually a boy starting to appear back here. There's another one back here. There's somebody standing in the doorway that we may not have noticed before. This appears to me to be an older woman. I'm not sure who that is. I would love to know who all these folks are. But I think there is a young person down here. I think those are arms of a young, young person. Okay, so we've got some trees. We can even help identify when we think this photograph may have been taken based on how much the trees are living or not. And I would guess this to be possibly a winter image, knowing that North Carolina gets pretty cold in the wintertime and it loses a lot of the leaves on the trees. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to tell. Okay, so now we're going to start adding clarity. Okay, so clarity is kind of like sharpening, but it works in a little bit different way. Um, clarity actually works a lot better. And a lot of times when you're doing this stuff, you want to work at 100%. So let's go into 100% and try and get as many of these faces as we can. So clarity is also going to introduce more noise. I can tell you that right now, but it also helps as I go up. It also helps sharpen the image. Okay. Now there's a dehaze function, which I just started using recently, and it's kind of interesting. It also does the same thing. It helps get rid of usually moisture in the air, um, fogginess, that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm going to pull dehaze in and see if that helps us at all. I don't want to overdo it too much. Now we've got a lot of noise in this image and we're going to soften the noise a little bit. But I would rather have noise in an image, especially a historic image like this. I would rather have noise 
than to have so soft like when you start playing with some of these um, uh, sharpening filters it can get so soft that it looks like a painting and uh, we lose the detail around the eyes and stuff so we'll get into that more in a minute now vibrance is similar to saturation and vibrance works better in my opinion than saturation but I'm gonna pull that down just a little bit because a lot of times when we're making these adjustments especially in old images they tend to get orange colored um, because as we're bringing things back uh, it also helps bring back some of the uh, color detail I'm gonna leave saturation just a slightly minus just ever so slightly so we still have a little tiny bit of color cast in this image but now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over and start looking at some of these other tools now this is curves we're not gonna get into curves today this is sharpening and we are going to get into sharpening a little bit so what happens with sharpening now you see like I said this the detail just was never there in this image when I photographed it um, but we can bring back a little bit more sharpening sometimes we get a little bit of a halo effect but in this case we're not um, and so here's the noise reduction I'm not going to get into the other radius and detail it's not going to help us a lot today noise reduction we can start adding noise reduction and it's going to start getting rid of some of the noise that you see here now I I'm going to back off of that just a little bit and especially with faces you don't want to soften it so much with noise reduction that you lose the eyes even though we're not seeing a lot of detail in these eyes um, we're we're going to minimize our noise reduction but we do have a color uh, noise reduction so we can pull in the color just a little bit and it starts to get rid of that green purpley look to it right so now I can go back and add just a little bit nor more normal noise reduction now that I've gotten rid of some of the color noise and let's take a look at what that looks like at a hundred percent I think I'll add a little bit more noise reduction again I don't want to lose the faces right and sometimes there's a little delay when you make that adjustment sometimes there's a little delay for the computer to work and as you add noise reduction sometimes especially in the dark areas you might start to see that purple and green tint come back so you can uh, you can add just a little bit more there's also color smoothness which really helps with that you can crank that up and it, I don't know if you can see that now you know once the video is compressed for YouTube sometimes you can't see those details so now we've got uh, this is at a hundred percent a little bit better uh, image let's look at it in the full view and we can look at the before and after side by side and um, that's a much better image than it was and as we toggle through you have a lot of different ways you can look at it from top and bottom uh, that's with these buttons down here and so now a couple other things that we can do with this image I'm gonna go back to the basics tab I can add some more clarity my contrast is really cranked my shadows are really all the way down and the other thing I want to show you on this too is we can we can talk this image doesn't have a lot of blacks or whites but we can toggle these um, indicators on and see the blue down here at the bottom that is showing me where the blacks are are crawling up the wall here that's where it's too black but in this case it's off the screen so I don't care I'm going to turn that one off. You can turn the whites on and do the same thing. And you can see in red where the whites are peaking. And that's where it's crawling up the wall of the histogram over here. And again, because it's off of the image, I don't care. So I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to pull the exposure up just a little bit more. And watch here. We'll turn this on again. See how this, in fact, I'll go too far just for demonstration purposes. See the red line over here on the side? that's what I'm talking about with the peaking and so a lot of times you want to bring that down to where it's just not peaking anymore but in this case there's nothing in the image that's peaking 
Um, and I don't know that we ever want to get to that point, but I'm going to see if I can crush the shadows a little. See, this, is, this helps raise the shadows. And if I do that in the mid-tones, we can... Oh, I don't know who this little guy is over here. Or even if there is somebody there, but it looks like there's somebody there to me. And so as we, every time we play with it, we got to double check to make sure that we don't have noise, um, color noise uh, being introduced again. And we can go back over here and we can add more noise reduction if we really think that that is too obnoxious um, with that noise. But again, I would almost rather have, because if I go too far with, uh, with noise reduction, look how soft it gets. It's it really muddy. Um, and so, you know, maybe we back off of that a little bit. And then when we zoom out to fit in view, it, it, it's, personally, it's a little soft for my taste. I would rather, I like her eyes, you can see her eyes. But I would rather have a little bit of noise in there. All right, I am going to jump back over here. Now we can play with color individually. And in this particular image, there's not a lot of color to play with, but we do have hue and we can play with each individual color i'm just briefly mentioning this uh, each individual color to change uh, so if we want to get rid of a little bit of this green cast we can make it a little bit warmer by pulling this in and i'm just not going to pull it in a lot i'm going to reduce the green just a little bit here um, and if we wanted to warm it up more we could add or subtract in the reds or the magentas, if you're trying to pull out different uh, colors, especially in a color image. Um, we also have saturation, so you can actually make this more saturated, which, which is basically the same color, but it's the volume of that color. And then luminance is really the brightness of that color. So if we wanted to take the yellows out completely, you, you see it gets really dark, right? Or we can make it brighter on the it's the it's the level of that from from dark to light in each one of those colors I'm just mentioning it also if you had shot the image with a special lens and I'm going to fit this in view so you can see what I'm talking about we can remove uh, any lens flare or, or lens aberrations if it's warped in this case you don't see it I've already straightened the image going back here again now that we've got the image looking a little bit better, I'm still going to bring up the exposure just a little bit. I'm going to crush the blacks as much as I can to try and bring out the darkness. Now across the top, we've got a lot of things we could do um, in this image. I'm not going to do a lot more other than some spot reduction. So you can come up here to spot removal and use the bracket keys for left and right makes the the uh, size of the brush larger and in this case I am using the type of brush I'm using as a heel as opposed to a clone so heel basically takes the spot and it says I'm gonna look at the pixels in the area around it and in this case it, it chose this area and it heals the image as opposed to cloning the exact spot um, and so you can also change the size of the brush, by the way, um, over here and the feather. So the feather is the inner circle with the outer circle. It's fading from the inner solid circle to the dashed outer circle. So it's, it's a softening. You could turn the feathering off completely and you don't see any feathering at all. Or you can make the feather really large and you can see it. Uh, there. Okay, and then um, the opacity, I always am using 100%, but you can, if you only want a mild change, you can use 50% uh, opacity and then just kind of paint over something a couple times. So here all I have to do is click and it, it chose this spot down here. If you don't like that, while this is selected, so this is the original spot and this is the target spot, you can grab that target and move it around if you would rather have it up here. And it's going to use the healing, and it almost did a clone there. Um, it, 
it will change based on that target circle. So left bracket to make the brush smaller. I'm going to click. So this is a little bit different than what we did in Photoshop in a previous episode where um, we had the content aware fill uh, tool, which is awesome for this kind of stuff. And there's also a spot healing brush tool. So here we've got a shingle, a line of a shingle, but we also have a dot here that we want to fix. So here it's picking up the edge of the, of the roof and that's okay. I could actually come up here and pick this shingle, the edge of the shingle there, which looks a little more natural to me. And all these circles are going to show, by the way, until we change tools. Once we change the tools, it goes away. But once we come back to the spot healing tool, uh, they come back. Now, if we wanted to get rid of that spot, all we have to do is select it, hit the delete key, and bye-bye, uh, it's gone. So uh, if I wanted to redo that, I could actually basically hit the undo and hit Control Z and it uh, redid the adjustment I had done. So you can continue to move on around the image and I, do this while you're zoomed in by the way. You don't want to do this on a wide view. Um, I'll even do this one outside. Here's a big one. Ooh, ugly. Sometimes I'll let the computer do the work for me and if it's really objectionable now this is on the edge of white. We'll see what happens. Well, look at that. That's not bad. Now here is, I'm going to hit the le left bracket, excuse me, the right bracket key to make the brush uh, larger. And I'm okay with that. What I really want to emphasize when we're doing this is to not uh, let the image, the change the content of the image to the point that it changes history, right? Now in this case we could try and heal this crack right here and how we would do that. See, but it's picking the other part of the crack. So I could come over here and it will heal that one part of the crack. I could drag and see if it fixes it. I would actually take this into Photoshop and use the um, spot healing brush tool in there because I think it would do a better job, but for the sake of fun, I will do it right here. And see now it's picking the other part of the crack because it's similar. I'm actually going to come down here and see what happens. All right, so. When, when in doubt, zoom out and change your brush, change your tools so that you can go back. Okay, what does that look like? Part of the problem is I think this crack also is also happening roughly at the same place that a shadow might be from another building or another something. Um, because it looks to me like even though there's not really much of a crack over here, it looks like the shadow of something. And so I think part of the part of the problem in fixing this is it's it's happening at the same time where there is a shadow. And so um, coincidentally, um, I think that could be an issue. So the idea is to continue working around the image and try and get rid of some of the bigger blemishes um, for sure. Let's see what's happening with her dress. I don't like that spot. Let's go down here and see if we can. That looks a little more natural to me. And again, left bracket tool makes the brush smaller. I'm going to go really small. You just want the brush to be just slightly larger than the area that you are um, removing spots from. Okay, so for the sake of argument, I am going to uh, finish this up and I'm going to look at the shadows one more time. It's, you know, sometimes it's the shadows that really make a difference and this really isn't pulling much out. I'm trying to get more contrast out of this image, but I am just about, I'm cranked on the, on the contrast. 
I've raised the exposure to the point where I can't go any farther because see how the, the whites in the sky and everything are starting to um, come up. I can try and dehaze it some more. Let's see what that does. It makes it a little muddy, but it does kind of pull that image out a little bit. Now I could go and take a gradient filter and try and pull the gradient filter in and lighten up the bottom or take a gradient filter and darken the top. I don't really want to do that because I can tell just by looking at this image that there is nothing to pull out of this image. There is so little information in here that it is, there, there's just not a lot here to work with. So, you know, you can only do so much. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to zoom back out and I'm going to show you the before and the after. I'm going to continue offline uh, fixing some more of the spots and dots around here but that is pretty much all I can do with this image. So one other little thing when you are done all you have to do is hit done and it will take you back into bridge and you will notice that there are little icons up top to show you that you had done some adjustments. Okay so while you are in bridge and remember I've got these blown up really big so you can see them. If you single click on the image, you can then uh, control it, you know, open in camera raw, or you can right click and open in camera raw. However, caution, if you double click on this image, it's going to open in Photoshop. Okay. But this shows you that there's been adjustments made and that there has been a crop made to this image. So if we right click and open in camera raw again, we are now back in and we can do additional adjustments. It used to be that with JPEGs that when you saved it, you wrote over the top of it, but these adjustments are not written over the top of it. So if you want, if you want to revert this image back to the way it was, you just hit the default button and boom, it's back to what it was. I'm going to control Z and undo that because what I want to forewarn you about is even though you hit done and it shows in camera raw the adjustments that you've made, if you go email this to somebody, it's not going to be adjusted. What you need to do is you come over here to save image and you save it as something else. Give it a new name. Give it a revised name. You can actually, what I do is I take this document name here. Well, first of all, you select your folder, right? I use the original document name. That way I always know what I've got, what I started with. And I'll come over here and I will say on the second part of this, revised, revised, whoops, revised. And sometimes I'll put a date on there. So it's this document name plus revised, right? Plus if I wanted to add the date I revised it or a serial number or something else, I could do that. You could actually add four elements here. And it says file extension DNG because this is originally a JPEG. I would just save it back as a JPEG. The problem is JPEGs are lossy formats. And so every time you save it, it's going to be slightly less than what it was originally. Always save it as a maximum, especially for historic preservation purposes. I always try and make this a 12, which gives it the full max and uh, of of resolution um, and if it started out as a 16-bit channel which this one is 8 bits save it back the way it was I always use Adobe RGB 1998 although you have a lot of other choices here um, just a word of caution sRGB is going to downgrade the quality of the video I mean quality of the still image so there you have it then you hit save so now I've got document name which is this image number right and revised and oh look it's butting up against the original image name so sometimes I'll put a space in there because I like spaces between things and now it's showing me what this example is this could be image number 1332 with a space revised okay you hit save and down here in the bottom it's showing you that it's in the process of saving so you can't really close it out till that disappears as it just did and then once we're done we go ba boom and now we have we have the revised image next to the uh, manipulated image but because of these adjustment little icons up here means that there was some adjustments to the original image and we could actually probably take it back we could actually remove the crop and go all the way back to the original image 
So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed it. You got uh, some serious adjustments there, even though that's what we started with. That's kind of what we ended up with. It's not a perfect image, but then again, it is 200 years old. So I still think it is a really cool image of the Back Creek Friends Monthly Meeting House, uh, established back in the late 1700s. I hope you enjoyed that. Talk to you later. Bye.